We finished last time by looking at intentions and extensional ways of bestowing meaning on sentences, and I mentioned that we were just going to focus on the intentional and extensional ways. So there is this false simplification here that is important philosophically, uh, but we're just sort of going to run with it now, and I will show some sort of practical differences between intention and extension, but not really a, a deep sort of philosophical difference. So we're not really that interested in just creating random meanings or bestowing random meanings upon things. What we actually want to do is we want to know how to, we should interpret particular predicate logic sentences. And so we, we really need to be able to do is generate interpretations of things. And as we can see, this is the example from last time, that there are many ways to interpret for all x, fx, arrow, gx. And it depends what f and g really mean. And how many interpretations are there? How many meanings are there for f and g? Well, the answer is infinitely many. What we're going to try and do is develop the skills to create interpretations ourselves. Now, an interpretation is actually something you are already very familiar with. An interpretation is essentially the abbreviation scheme that you have used all along to symbolize with. And we're going to be a bit more precise with that, but that's what an interpretation is. It tells you what the predicates mean, what the constant and the operations mean, or it tells you the meaning of the sentential sentences. So the interpretations give you this meaning. Now, the sort of weird thing that is new in an interpretation is this one, the universe of discourse. And so I'm going to have to go through what a universe of discourse is and how it impacts the meaning and what we've been doing without it in the past. But what you need to know right now is that an interpretation can essentially make our statements true or false depending on how we define all these things, how we define the universe of discourse, predicates, constants, what they mean, etc. Now the universe of discourse, or the UD as it is often called, is a pretty st straightforward concept. What we're talking about is what the quantifier for all really means. Now in the past we've left the universe of discourse sort of unmodified, which is to say it's unrestricted. All literally means all things. Uh, but in reality, we rarely talk like that. So if I want to say or mean every student likes philosophy, uh, what does the every mean? Do I mean all possible things? So am I including potential students in sort of faraway galaxies and stuff like that? That seems to be sort of a ridiculous scope of my universal quantifier. It seems that I want a more restricted universe of discourse. So we can be explicit about this and we can define the universe of discourse to really make it clear what I'm talking about. Perhaps I'm talking about students at U of T specializing in philosophy. And then in that context, I could say, oh, every student likes philosophy. Now that might be a reasonable context if we're already talking about specialists in philosophy at a U of T, say, faculty meeting or something like that. And then we could argue whether or not that's true or false. Well, it seems that, you know, that's probably true. Like if hopefully if you're specializing in philosophy, you actually like philosophy. But I don't know. What's to say that there's someone out there who's specializing in philosophy because their parents really pressured them into specializing in philosophy or something like that? Uh, and they actually don't really like it. Is that possible? Actually, yeah. Maybe not the parent situation, but it's actually reasonably probable that there's someone who's specializing in philosophy who has sort of lost their passion or interest for it. So we're not that sure. Now, what if I change the universe of discourse to chemistry majors in the world? So all students at a university majoring in chemistry. Uh, now, in this case, it seems clear that my statement, every student likes philosophy, is false. But again, I'm not so sure. You know, maybe chemistry students are actually deeply philosophical and they actually really love it. And I just don't know because I wasn't a chemistry student. That could be the case. Now, if I say unrestricted, well, then I have that problem of maybe alien worlds across the galaxy and so on. And again, this probably seems false, but I don't know. I don't have this sort of like worldwide galactic view and insight into students and philosophy. So this is where sort of things get tricky. Now, I've introduced lots of different concepts here, but fundamentally, the most important one in this slide is that I want you to see that how we pin down and define the universe of discourse does actually change how we interpret the sentence even if I know F predicate means student and the G predicate means philosophy uh, and, and so uh, or likes philosophy. So depending on the universe of discourse, we still have radical interpretations. We're ready now to look at sort of complete interpretations of our sort of pet sentence here, which is for all X, FX, arrow, GX. So one way we could interpret this 
is to say that the universe of discourse are edible things, and the F predicate is, is bacon, and the G predicate is, is tasty. So what does this say? This says all edible things that are bacon are tasty. Now, why do I have to restrict it to edible things? Because I don't know, maybe someone named a building bacon, and I wouldn't want to say that building is tasty, right? That's, the, that's sort of like the convenient part of restricting the universe of discourse. And that's typically done by sort of context in a conversation. But obviously, when we do logic, we can't rely on context. We want to be really explicit about it. Once we have an interpretation, we can ask if the sentence is true or false. But it seems that the answer is true because obviously bacon is great. Uh, but also, that's just not also, like so clear that everyone will agree with that. There are surely lots of people out there who disagree. And so the truth value of, for all xfx arrow gx, even though I have perfectly bestowed an interpretation that gives nice meaning to everything, uh, the truth of it is still unclear. And that's a problem for us. Now, I could try something different. I could say the universe of discourse is rocks. And if you're a rock, then you're alive. But most people, again, would say this is false. But what about this guy? Is this guy alive? I don't know, maybe all rocks are alive in a sense. Maybe we share some common spirit with the world or something. I don't know. This is tricky and this is annoying. This type of territory is not what we want to be sort of talking about when we are learning the semantics of predicate logic. While this problem that I highlighted isn't unique to intentional interpretations, it is probably the worst in intentional interpretations. So now we're going to move to extensional. But before we do that, we just have to brush up on our set theoretic notation. Set theoretic notation is a way for us to describe collections of things. So here I have the set A. What is in the set A? What is in the collection of thing, uh, of set A? Well, we have E1, E2, E3. What are these things? I don't know. I just made them up. Set B might be a little clearer. I have a circle. I have a square. I have a heart. Uh, set D, I have the numbers 0, 2, 7, 9. And then in set F, I've created one with people, Alex, Rosie, Jimmy, and Michael. Who are these people? Well, it doesn't matter. They're people I know. Actually, one of them is me. And I just put them together in this collection. Now, notice I didn't physically put them together. This is just an abstract concept, but I can talk about them as a collection. The set G is a bit different because here the members of the set are actually uh, ordered pairs, like the pair 0, 1, 2, 3. So what could that be? like a coordinate system or something like that. And I could say, oh, here are the important coordinate systems. I've grouped them together. So I've used some of the set theoretic language already. That's important to know. Uh, one of the things you need to know is the concept of element or membership. This is really crucial to set theory. And we would say that anything that is in the set is an element of that set or a member of that set. So in this example, E2 is a member of A. I can also count the number of elements in a set and I can talk about how big the set is. So the set F has four elements or members, Alex, Rosie, Jimmy, Michael, so it's of a size four. Finally, it is possible to have a set with nothing in it, and if you have a set with nothing in it, you can use this sort of special uh, empty set notation, or you could just literally have a set notation with the squiggly brackets with nothing in it, and that's just the empty set. We'll use this notation to talk about extensional interpretation. So again, here's our nice sentence for all x, fx, arrow, gx. Now, one way we could extensionally define it is sort of cheating. So this first way I'm just going to use for a little illustration, and it's a little bit of a cheat. So here I say the universe of discord is the set of philosophers, f predicate is the set of logicians, and g predicate is the set of amazing things. Now, you can see why this is a bit cheating. Technically, I'm supposed to list everything in my extensional interpretation. So I should actually list all the philosophers, list all the logicians, list everything in the universe that's amazing, uh, or, or list all the philosophers that are amazing. But that's actually, you know, difficult to do, so I've sort of gestured at it. So what does this sentence say under this interpretation? It says that for all philosophers, if you're a logician, then you're amazing. Now, is that true? Well, I guess I sort of want to say that's true, but it might not be true. You know, Bertrand Russell was a famous logician, and in a lot of ways he was amazing. But he also did a lot of dumb things. Frege is a very famous logician and philosopher, but it's hard to say he was amazing too. He also had some views that are not so okay, socially speaking. Well, what about this one? Here, the universe of discourse, I've sort of gestured at 
but I've still been more precise. I've used the dot, dot, dot. So here the UD is one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. So what am I talking about? I'm just talking about the natural numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc., etc. Now F1 is 10, 20, 30, dot, dot, dot. And G1 is two, four, six, dot, dot, dot. So loosely speaking, you might have looked at F1 as meaning, oh, multiples of 10, and G1 being even. And so what this really says is all multiples of 10 are even. Is that true? Well, yeah. And we actually can do this intentionally, which is how I just spoke it, and extensionally, and that's really nice. And so mathematics has this nice feature, as I've talked about in the past with uh, the tri a triangle example. But what if we don't want to do math? It turns out that extensional definitions we can still do in a really interesting way just by picking out random abstract objects. So in the previous one, it's like you needed to know something about even or natural numbers to figure it out, but you actually didn't. Take a look at this last extensional interpretation. Here, my universe of discourse are just three things. There's only three things in my universe, A, D, and G. What is F? Well, only A and G are Fs, okay? What are G? Well, the only thing that satisfy the G predicate is A and D. Now, if you look at the sentence, it says, for anything that's A, D, or G, if you're an F, then you're a G. Is that true or false? Now, the really neat thing here is actually the answer is unequivocally false, because there is something that's an F, namely the little g, that is not a capital G, and it, not, it is not captured by the G predicate at all. So what's nice about these last two examples is I don't have this issue of, well, is this true or is this false? And we can see in the very last one, where I talk about the letters A, D, G, we don't even know what these things mean, and it doesn't really matter, because extensionally, I've defined the universe of discourse, and I've defined F, and I've defined G, and now I can assess truth very easily. So you might object that these things are just sort of meaningless, especially this one with the ADG. Like, I haven't given a real interpretation. I've given a fake one. I still don't know what these things mean. I don't know what F means. I don't know what G means. But we have to remember that's actually not the case. It is true that these things are abstract and these things, namely the universe of discourse, the F predicate and the G predicate, are extensionally defined. But remember, from the last video, we learned that extension does bestow meaning. You can capture meaning extensionally no problem. And also remember our nice false simplification. If I capture meaning extensionally, I could have also done it intentionally and we would have arrived at the same meaning, the same concept. So don't think that there's no meaning here. Don't think that I can't really assess truth and semantic properties just because I did it in this abstract way. It's the abstractness isn't the issue. We just have to become comfortable with extensional interpretations. Let's just have a quick comparison of some of the pros and cons of intentional and extensional on a practical level. This isn't too important, but it'll sort of help uh, set the stage for the, the subsequent videos. So I could define a predicate A intentionally and extensionally, and clearly I capture the same meaning. The first one on top, the purple one, is the extensional, intentional. Uh, A is a natural number between one and six, and you can see the extensional version of it is just the, select, se uh, the selection or the set two, three, four, five, and that captures the meaning great. I could also start with an extensional one, U of T, Ryerson, York, OCAD, and take the set of that. And then I could say, well, what does that capture? Oh, that captures is a university in Toronto. Now, is that true? Actually, I'm not so sure. I think those are the only universities in Toronto, but maybe there's another, or maybe one of these for some reason isn't a university. I'm pretty sure that part's not true. Uh, regardless, this seems pretty reasonable. One advantage intentional has over extensional is I don't have to do this sort of like dot, dot, dot gesturing that I have to do in extensional for infinite or very large things. So I can say C is a natural number and we know what that means. But for the extensional, I have to use the dot, 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 which sort of just fuels your imagination so you can fill in the gaps. Now, most of us are perfectly happy with the dot, 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 so it's not that big of a deal. But here's an interesting case where extensional is actually a lot better than the intentional version. So my extensional definition is mouse, bus, French toast, pig, phone, 
coffee, rosy, bowl. Okay, that's clearly a collection of objects, and I'm saying let D be this collection of objects. But how would I intentionally define that? How would I give you a nice clean definition that captures those things? In reality, those things are sort of things that I saw while looking around writing this lecture. And that's not a good definition because I actually saw a lot of other things that didn't make the cut. So finding the right intentional definition of a sort of seemingly random extensional collection can be difficult. And in that case, the extensional has an advantage. Now, we're only missing a couple things to complete our understanding of interpretations, and they're pretty straightforward. The first is we have to know how to give an interpretation of a constant. So a constant is like a name letter, like A. And so typically, a constant picks out an individual from our university of, dis from our universe of discourse. So here, I have A0 picks out Joe. Now, that's not so great because I don't know what Joe is. And what if I told you that Joe was this? Well, then you might be a bit confused, but then you'd be like, OK, fine. You sort of, you know, pull the fast one on me. Instead, what I mean are all people. But then that's the universe of discourse. Which Joe am I talking about? Maybe I'm talking about this one. So I can narrow it down and I can say the universe of discourse are American politicians. So maybe I'm talking about this guy. So the problem with this is it's just a little bit um, hard to really make crystal clear, but for the most part, context sort of plays a key role. Now, the nice thing about extensional interpretations is because I define the universe of discourse in this set theoretic way, it's actually crystal clear what I'm talking about. If my UD is Joe, Gupreet, and Jennifer, well, then when I'm talking about Joe, and I, if I pin down the name letter A0 is Joe, then it's crystal clear I'm talking about the Joe from my universe of discourse, and that's it. Now, what if I have multiple Joes? I would use a little subscript like Joe 1, Joe 2, whatever. But the most important thing is you just have to remember that a constant must pick out something from the universe of discourse. An operation is similar. Remember, an operation, even if it's complex, actually just picks out something in the universe of discourse as well, and it picks out an individual as well. So here's an example of an interpretation of an operation. So if I have the universe of discourse as U of T students, then I could say, oh, OK, well, my operation D is the best friend of blank. But this is a problem, because for me to really know the meaning of D, I would have to know the best friend relationship of everyone. And I just don't. I don't know who your best friend is. You might not even have a best friend. You might have many best friends, if that's possible. But if we take it extensionally, I could define a set for my universe of discourse and say my set is uh, Yosef, Ramona, Jessica, and Simone. And then I could just say, what does the D operation do? Well, the D of Yosef is Jessica, and the D of Simone is Ramona. Now, what does the D relationship mean? You might insist, does it still mean best friend? And I could just say, eh, don't worry about it. Remember, extension provides meaning. I don't need to give you an intentional meaning on top of an extensional meaning. Just the extensional meaning is enough. All D does is it tells you the D of Joseph or Yosef is Jessica and D of Simone is Ramona. Now, what is the D of Ramona? There is no, uh, there is no individual that is the D of Ramona and that's okay. Now, of course, you can do it uh, abstractly just with numbers or with symbols. So here the universe of discourse is one, two, three, four. And I say D one is three and D four is two. And if you pay close attention, you'll notice that the third interpretation is essentially the exact same as the second because the D functions essentially in the same way. This is what an interpretation is. We've gone through, we now know that we can provide an interpretation that makes statements true or false. And what really matters is the universe of discourse. And we did a quick comparison between intentional and, and extensional ways. Now, the thing is, we don't just want to make interpretations randomly. We want them to sort of show something. We want to make an interpretation with a purpose. So typically, an interpretation with a purpose is called a model. A model is a special type of interpretation designed to show a particular semantic property. Either you have it or you don't. Some people call a counterexample or a counter model a very special interpretation to show you don't have a property, but that doesn't really matter too much. So for example, I could generate a model that shows a set of sentences is consistent. 
but I would generate a counter model to show that an argument is invalid. I'm not going to worry too much about this. In general, whenever we want to show a semantic property or lack of semantic property, I'm just going to talk about models. Now, what you can see is that models actually come with three critical types of choices that you need to make. Is your model, which remember is just an intention, uh, an interpretation, is your model intentional or is it extensional? Is the universe of discourse that you're working with infinite or is it finite? And finally, are the things you're talking about concrete or abstract? So concrete things are things in the world, like rocks or Joe or something like that, people. But a lot of the stuff that we looked at in some of these examples were purely abstract. Circle, square, heart, one, two, three. E1, E2, E3. These are sort of just abstract things that we're just using to show semantic properties. And it's nice to be abstract because you don't have to worry about actual features of the world that you may or may not know. A lot of these concepts we will be talking about at great length in the videos coming up. Remember that a model is meant to show a semantic property, and these are the semantic properties that we know. Statements, sets of statements, and arguments can all have semantic properties. But you should notice something immediately problematic about this list. This list comes from unit two, which is when we did sentential logic. And so these are defined sententially. If you look at them, they're defined purely in terms of TVAs, truth value assignments, which means they're talking about truth tables. And we know that we can't use truth tables to do truth in predicate logic. Instead, we have to move to updated definitions of our semantic properties. But these updated definitions are essentially predictable. They're updated instead of talking about TVAs, we're now talking about interpretations. So what is a tautology in predicate logic? A tautology or a logical truth in predicate logic is to say that all interpretations, the sentence is true. In every single interpretation, that sentence must be true. And that's just slightly different wording wise than saying in all TVAs, but in concept and understanding wise, it actually is massively different. It indicates that we're not talking about a truth table with this nice decidable feature. We're talking about interpretations where we actually have to pin down potentially infinitely many interpretations to demonstrate a property. So you can take a look at this closely and think about it, but just like in sentential semantics, we're gonna run into problems where it's very easy to show some properties but seemingly impossible to show others. This was the problem that we were faced with right off the bat in our last video, that truth and predicate logic is not decidable and truth depends on meaning, how many meanings are there, and the answer is infinite. And we've really sort of developed our ability to sort of start, try and tackle this problem. What we really want are models of things, and models are interpretations that are designed to demonstrate some sort of semantic property. And we need to make those decisions between intentional and extensional, abstract, concrete, and finite and infinite. We're going to start in probably the easiest section, which is going to be a finite model, and it's going to be extensional, and it's going to be abstract. These are easy because it gets us the furthest away from some of the real world issues of truth and meaning that we sort of saw emerge when we looked at some of the other types of uh, models and interpretations out there. After that, we'll try and extend our semantics to become a more powerful and robust system. But we will see that there are sort of fundamental, perhaps crippling limitations lurking around the corner.